19, we're moving through the letters of Yud. Today we're going to try to cover two verses, verses 78 and 79, as we approach the end of this set of psukim that correspond to the smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Yeveshu Zaydim. In the 78th verse of Psalm 119, David HaMelech begins by saying, May those who willfully transgress your Torah be shamed. Ki sheker ifsuni, for they have maligned me falsely. Ani osiach b'fikudecha. I will speak of your precepts. That's what the Pasuk says, if you just translate it. <laughs> what in heaven does that mean? What is the connection between the beginning of the Pasuk? Thank you. So there seems to be three parts of this verse. Part one is Yeveshu Zaydim. Those who are Zaydim, those who are wanton sinners, should be shamed. That's a good thing. I guess those bad people should be shamed. Okay. Why should they be shamed? Ki sheker if sunni. Because they have falsely accused or maligned David HaMelech in a deceitful fashion. That's why they should be shamed. And what, if, and what if these are bad people, but they didn't attack David HaMelech? Then it's okay. I'm questioning the key. That's the bridge between Yevesh and The first two words are, those who are bad should be shamed. The next two words are, Sheket if Sunni. Okay, you could say, bad people should be shamed. They have accused me falsely. Why does it say key? What's the, what's the bridge? And then there's the third part of the verse. Ani, I, says David Melch, I, Asir Fiku Decha. I'm going to be speaking about your words of the Torah. What does that have to do with the people who are bad being shamed? And what does it have to do with being maligned falsely? What's the connection? Like, what is David Melch saying? How, how, what, what exactly is the statement that's being made in this verse? That's the question that I'm asking. That's what I've been wrestling with all morning. So let me tell you what Rashi says. Let me tell you what Radak says. Let me tell you what the Mitsudis David says in Ibn Ezra. Then let me tell you why I don't know what they're saying. <laughs> what, I, what I still don't understand. And, and then I'll take you in an interesting direction. I'm going to share with you the words of, of the Malbum, which on the surface also seem a little bit odd. They seem like throws like a curveball. But this kind of will bring us in a direction that I think is going to put everything together by virtue of something that the Alta Rebbe says in Tanya. That's what's going to happen for the next couple of minutes. Okay, now you have, now you have your next hour charted out. Okay, let's start with Rashi. That will be the, 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 I guess, the best place to start. So Rashi does not comment on Yeveshu Zaydim. He doesn't say anything about let the wanton sinners be shamed. He doesn't say anything about that. That's, that's kind of self-understood. People who are bad should be shamed. Why should they walk around proud? This is how it is in today's world. They walk around proud. <laughs> of course they should be shamed. Al Sharpton, Yamach Shemai, a busy kissing Farrakhan who calls us termites, for which you call the exterminator, basically Holocaust Nazi kind of verbiage, and Al Sharpton is busy kissing him on stage, but then he's on, on the next stage condemning the murder of Jews in Pittsburgh. And oilum goilum. Just no problem. Just goes. You get tear your hair out of your head. Lunatics. How did you sit there? How did you invite him? It's Meshuga. Man is a raving anti Semite. So if we would say that people like this should be shamed, okay, of course they should be shamed. They should hang their heads in shame. These people are paragons of hypocrisy. And David Amel dealt with a lot of that. There's nothing new about this. This has been going on ever since when? Rashi says nothing. Ki Shekerev Sunni because they have attacked David HaMelech with falsehood, maligned him falsely. What does that mean? When was David HaMelech maligned falsely? What were the accusations? What did they say about him? So Rashi says, and interestingly, he says he found this. He doesn't say where, but with Matsasi. He says, Ki alchinam hishiuni, because they falsely condemn me. They accused David Melech of evil and of wickedness, which wasn't true, which wasn't, wasn't real. It's also kind of very timely, where people get accused of doing things, 
And all of a sudden, if they get accused, it must be true because of people's partisanship. Fake news, fake everything. It's like it's mishuga. See, there's nothing wrong with having different, different political parties. That's a normal thing. We, want, we don't want to live in a society that's monolithic. We want to live in a society that has vibrant debate. We want to live in a society where there's going to be different approaches to solving problems, and people should have choices. Anybody who's not for that should have their head examined. We know what that looks like. That's, that's communism. That's bad. It was never good. <laughs> it didn't work last time. It wouldn't work a second time. But partisanship means I have no longer an open mind. I'm not values-based. I don't care about anything other than my team has to win. And anything goes. Any lie, any, any falsehood, any evil, anything goes. As long as my ideological bent, this is pure idolatry actually, because it's like a faith. It's like it has nothing to do with rhyme and reason. Only faith is beyond the call of rhyme and reason, and this is lunacy beneath the call of rhyme and reason. This is, this is literally modern-day idolatry. And in the modern-day idolatry, if the person's on your team, when he gets accused, well, you know, people are innocent until proven guilty. But if people on the other team, they're guilty. Why? What do you mean? Because, because they're on the wrong team. So this is like a, a profoundly deceitful, dishonest a society of, of hypocrisy. A, literally a society of hypocrisy where there's no, no truth anymore. Truth has no value to us, chas v'shalom. And David Melch talks about that. He says, Sheikh Sunni. David Melch seems to say, if I do something wrong, I'll take the criticism. Not beyond, nobody says beyond criticism. But, but, but the lies and the cheating and the deceit, that's beyond the pale. That's not acceptable. <laughs> Somebody said to me, you, you can't accept criticism about Israel? I said, I can't accept criticism? I could even criticize Israel. I think it was a, it was a terrible thing what they did in Gaza. The Israeli government has blood on their hands. An awful thing. I could criticize. First of all, I don't do that in public. But I said, besides, besides the point, that my problem is with lies and cheating. My problem is deceit. When Israel is framed as an apartheid state, that's a lie. We're called occupiers. That's a lie. It's just lies. So David Amal says, they should be shamed. They should, should be ashamed of their lies. That's the key, Kishakid of Sunni. David Amal is not just making a general prayer. The wicked should be shamed. The wicked should be destroyed, whatever. They should, they should do tshuva. He said, to be ashamed of themselves. How, does nobody blush anymore? Could you be such a hypocrite? Will you come and accuse somebody who's innocent of being, some, of being a nefarious individual, of being a criminal? Well, you yourself know it's a lie. So David HaMelech says, Yevejah said, these people should be shamed. Ki shekadiv suni. Because all of their accusations were false. This is an unusual Rashi, because Rashi, first thing, he, he quotes something, he says, Matsasi. Usually Rashi will bring us teachings of, of the Medrash or, or of, from a Gemara, something from our sages. Here he says, Matsasi. He doesn't even use, it's just like I found. And then he says, Oimer Ani, I say, Alibun Ponim. That what's really bothered David and Melech was on the fact that they shamed. They should shame because they shamed. You should be ashamed of shaming, you should be ashamed of what you did. How current is this? Like, like how amazing. Sha'im Rimli, they would go by and say to Dawrmach, Habalish Ish, a person who committed adultery with a married woman. Misase Bima, could you please remind us? We have a question, Dawrmach. Question because you're you know you're pasting halachas. When somebody commits adultery with a married woman, so what exactly, which kind of, of death penalty is supposed to be meted out? And of course, they were not looking for any answers to the question. They were just kind of insinuating that David Melech was guilty of this. And Rashi says, just makes a blanket statement, Vahu loy chata. He did not sin. Now, David Melech's uh, actions with Bathsheba are, are certainly questionable. And there's a lot to be said about it. And I'm not going to try to address it in today's class. I'm not saying it's beyond being addressed. I'm just not in, in today's class. Because that is a class and a half in and of itself. But our sages, Chazal, do say, Kol ha'imer. David Chata, whoever says David sinned, Eino Yelatoya, is misguided, is mistaken. You cannot say David sinned. It's not in the classic sense of sin. That which David Amel is accused of is actually not true. It doesn't mean there wasn't impropriety. It doesn't mean that there wasn't an issue over here. David Amel himself spent his life doing tshuva for what he acknowledged was, was, it was a shortcoming until he destroyed his Yetzirah and became a full tzaddik. But the notion that David Melch sinned in a crass sense, 
in a literal sense, is not true. And these people themselves were, may have been guilty of this. They accused David and Melech of what they themselves did. So, he didn't actually do what he's being accused of. And since they were seeking to malign him, so Yeveshu Zaydim, they should be ashamed. Ki Shekedev Sunni. I guess that's the key. It's the key because, because Shekedev Sunni, it's almost like they tried to malign him falsely. They should be ashamed of what they did or ashamed by what they did. Rashi does not talk about Aniyasir Bichfikudecha. Again, it's a Yeveshu Zaydim, evildoers, sinners be shamed. That, that is what it is. It's understood literally. I am going to speak about your precepts. Yeah, that, that is. That's what David Melech did. He, he studied Torah. Contrary to what most people think about David Melech as being a great warrior, or a, a poet, a musician, a romantic, or whatever the kind of words people use to describe David Melech, the real description of David Melech, the real definition of David Melech, by his, by his own definition, was a student of Torah. And not just a student of Torah, but a halachist. And David Melech's major contribution, even though his Piske Halacha are not recorded primarily, what's recorded is Tillim, the book, book of Tillim, the book of Psalms, the book of, of prayer, which is the foundation of most prayers. But David Melech's primary occupation was Torah study. So he said, They accuse me of being A. Rashi does not explain how and why that's the response. Okay, so now we know what Rashi says. Any questions about Rashi says? Kind of can understand. Rashi just deals with those three words. Ki Shekhar of Sunni. What are we talking about here? He says, being maligned, maligning the innocent. And specifically, Rashi says, this it seems to me the shame that they tried to heap upon David and Melech for the story, the narrative of Bathsheba. Let's move across to the Radak. Incidentally, the Ibn Ezra says, very, very. Uh, very similar things. He says, Ratsu la Okay, we'll go back to Ibn Ezra soon. Let's, let's go to Radak. So Radak, he also explains only the word, the, 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 he explains the words Kishakidev Sunni, but actually he transcribes Yeveshu Zaydim and he transcribes Ani Asirch Befikudecha. The first two words of the Pasuk and the last three words of the Pasuk. Exactly the opposite of what Rashi does. Rashi transcribes the middle three words of the Pasuk. Yeveshu Zaydim is the first two words. I speak in your, your, your testimonies, your precepts. This is the last three words. He, Rashi transcribed, explained, Kishekidiv Sunni. Radak does exactly the opposite. He transcribes the words, Yeveshu Zaydim. And he transcribes the words, Vani Asir Befukudecha. And what does he say? Yeveshu Zaydim. Why should they be shamed? Radak says, Ki Besheker Hoyu Mashiach Maisi. Because they maligned me with falsehood. They falsely accused me. They falsely maligned me. They, see, they sought to, to, to make me guilty falsely. So that's why they should be shamed. So he's more direct. He does share with us that, that David and Malach is maligned falsely. He does not go into the details. However, he says they should be shamed because they falsely maligned me. Radak emphasized, that's why they should be shamed. But I am speaking about your words. So David HaMelech says, this means to say, says Radak, Kol si heim. The currency of my conversations is in your precepts. That's my focus. And they are accusing me of being a different kind of person. They're accusing me of falsehood. But I'm speaking in words of Torah. They should be ashamed of their words. I'm not sure what this means. I, I'm not sure what Radak means when he says this. I'm not, I'm, I'm, all my talk is in your precepts. So maybe he mean, means to say, they accuse me of being a sinner, but really I'm a saint. I mean... Why do you have to say, and what if David Melch wasn't Ani Sichasi Bifikudecha? What if David Melch spoke about other things, then it was, then it was okay to, to malign him? I don't, I don't really understand what Radak is saying, but that's what he's saying. he's saying. He's saying that they accused me of falsehood. My response, and I, in fact, was only focused on your Torah. So this needs to be understood. I, I don't understand it. I mean, I don't know if it needs to be understood. I need to understand it. I, I don't have clarity. The Mitzud is David. 
Interestingly, he, he, he does transcribe the words of Rashi. He says, Kishakir of Sunni. That's, that's what he, and he says, if Sunni is Moloshan Avain, means from sin and equity. And he says, Besheker Toilim be Avain. They are attributing criminology to me, which is, which is false. I'm being falsely accused. Why am I being falsely accused? Because I am speaking in your words. My engagement in Torah would save me from sin. So here it seems, the Mitzudah's David seems to fi- follow a different path. He seems not to be alluding to Bathsheba. And maybe this is what the Dach is speaking about also. So the Dach is saying, they accuse me of being a sinner, but when would I have time to sin? <laughs> they accuse me of doing all kinds of bad things. He says, I don't have any time to do bad things. The Sheker Taylor be of it. They're saying, oh, you did sins. They're, they're attributing, they're attaching these sins to me. But I need to see of Vigudecha. All I'm doing is I'm talking words of Torah. And Eisek HaTayra, Matzalus Min Oven. I'm so busy with Torah that that would preclude me or shield me from doing any kinds of sins. So they're accusing me of being a sinner. When it, it's not fair to accuse me of that. It's, it's almost like they once asked somebody, uh, say, no, you're doing any Averis these days? He says, uh, yeah, I probably would. I don't have any time. <laughs> <laughs> being busy is a good thing. Especially be busy with holy things. I'm so busy with holy things. I'm so, I'm so immersed in Torah. I don't even have time to sin. And anyway, Torah protects a person from sin. So I'm, I'm, I'm immersed in Torah. And therefore, they accuse me of all kinds of things. But it's not true. It's not true. And the proof is that I'm studying Torah. A, I have no time. B, it protects me. So here, from, from, from Mitzudas' perspective, David and Melech, this is like a general thing, not just specific to the Bathsheba story, but they always, the, David's detractors, their favorite line was, he's a sinner. That was their favorite line. They're always trying to say, oh, you did this wrong, you did that wrong. David Melech says, they accuse me of things which are not true. I'm just immersed in your Torah. That's all I'm doing. That's all I'm doing. So basically, we, 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 have, we have like al- almost three different approaches here. The approach of Rashi that we're talking, this is the Bathsheba story. And so, so why is he a Veshu Zaydim? They, they should be ashamed. They should be ashamed of accusing me of this because, because they're lying to me. And I need a Chasir Befukudecha. Rashi doesn't explain. Radak's perspective is they accuse me of falsehood, but in turn, I am speaking your words. How does that become an in turn? What's the. And Mitzudas' perspective is the Ani Asir B'fikudecha is I was so busy studying Torah I didn't even have any time to sin. So, so how does Rashi understand this? How does Radak understand it? If that's what this is about just Dovin Melch explaining that the reason that he's certain that they accused him falsely is because he's busy studying Torah how would Rashi explain this? And let me tell you why Rashi can't explain it like the Mitzudas David because the Mitzudas David says I can't be sinning because I'm studying Torah I'm too busy I'm protected. But David Melch is talking about a specific event. Like, he's not denying that event. So what are you going to tell me? I couldn't have sinned 50 years ago because I'm too busy studying Torah now. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't work out. How does Rashi learn this? Really, how does Radak learn it? Yes, but how does it help if you're learning Torah now? How, Mitzudu says, I'm learning Torah. Okay, so Matzelis Min Oven, how did that happen? Was that what David and Melch meant? That even though then it seems that I did inequity, but since I was studying Torah then also, so I was, I was saved from sin? Like, a little bit of a stretch. I mean, uh, maybe. Maybe, that, maybe that's what it means. Then would have to mean, my, my discussion then was in Torah. What does that have to do with now? Mitzvah sees it like a dynamic thing. They're, they're falsely accusing me, and all I'm doing is studying Torah. But Rashi has a different approach to this. And it seems Radak also seems to be talking. They were, past tense. They're, they're, they're saying upon me false things. So the Medrash Tilim says like this. Very, very like, cryptic Medrash Tilim. Medrash Tilim in this verse goes as follows. Yevesh Zaydim Kishekid Sunni. Omar David, David said, Even though the Rishoyim accused me, they, see, they sought to discredit me, I didn't abandon your Torah. I didn't abandon your Torah. They sought to discredit me, I didn't abandon your Torah. It's 
very different, very different concept. This is not the pshat we'd be hearing. David HaMelech is saying something different. They sought to discredit me. I didn't abandon the Torah. Why should David HaMelech have abandoned the Torah if they discredited him? And he says, V'chein hu'aymer, Esar bo'as elo yoldu laharpa. These four were born to harpa, begas, etc. And I'll explain it to you in a moment. The Medrash Tum will just finish it off. Afal pisha omdu alai. Even though they stood against me, I never abandoned the Torah. As it says, David David spoke these words of song. Okay, so to understand what the Medrash Tillam is, we have to take a look in the book of Shmuel Beis. In the end of chapter 21, and then leads into chapter 22. David Mel says like this. He says, Es arbas elo yuldu laharpa. Who is harpa? Well, harpa is arpa. Arpa, as you may remember, is the sister-in-law of Rus. Rus is this righteous convert mm -hmm. who gives birth to the future Davidic dynasty. Mm -hmm. Her sister-in-law was married to Kilion. There's Machlon and Kilion. She was married to Kilion. She also followed Rus out after the Seder. And then, and then Naomi and Naomi said, go home, go home. Mm -hmm. and, and, and Arpa you know, wept and she dropped four tears. The Gemara in Seder tells us and because of this she merited to have, give birth to four mighty warriors. The most famous of which is Goliath. Goliath. David Melch was actually fighting his cousin. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. The paternity unknown, because when Arpa left, she was like kind of converted, kind of joined the Jewish people. And when she left, she left with a vengeance and she engaged in like this orgy of orgies. Like she slept all over the place and did all kinds of crazy things. It was like unbelievable. Right? Like like she was the paradigm of sin. She went right back to She went back to Moab, but she went she went back with a vengeance. Like it was like it was like no, take no prisoners, kind of like he went all the way. <laughs> so, so, so he was the daughter of Naomi, right? So, so the Gemara in Mesechet Seita on page forty-two B says, "Dara Shrava Rava said, Beschar Arba Dmois Shedido Arpa Acham Moisa Naomi because she wept sincerely. She did drop four tears, and every tear a person drops sincerely, Hashem counts. So Zochs of Yatsam and these uh, three gibar, four Gibayim, and then and then David Melch overcame them." And this is a very interesting, this is the meaning of what it says, that B'nai Hanashuka fell into the hands, that, 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 the, that the children of the kissed one were, fell in, in, uh, we inherited or fell into the hands, the one of the one who, who, who was cleaving. So there was the Nashuka and the Devuka. Rus was the Devuka. She, clo she cleaved to, 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 to Naomi, whereas the other one kissed her goodbye. <laughs> so... The one who kissed goodbye had children who fell into the hands of the one who clung to Naomi. It's like... And we have... So that's what the Gemara says. And then, the very next chapter, which in general the chapters are not really from necessarily a Jewish source, but the very next Pasuk is, Vayedaber David Hashem is David HaShir David HaMelech spoke these words of, of, of song, which is known as Shiraz David, and it's actually the Haftorah on at least on one occasion when we, when we read the Shira, we talk about, about the song. It's the Shira of uh, Shri Yishol Pesach. And this Shira comprises the 18th chapter of Tehillim with, with the variations. But this is called Shira's David. So Shira's David, the Gemara says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu should said to David HaMelech that I'm saying this Shira because of all the things that happened during the course of my life. And Rashi sums it up and he's saying, Le'ezik Nusay, tore his elder years. Overall of Kol Tzareisav, David HaMelech had all these difficult travails. The Nitzel Mikulim, he was saved from them. And so he sums up his life's experiences, challenges, travails, difficulty, and he sings Hashem a song. Okay. Like so, what is the Medrash Tillam saying? David HaMelech was saved from these four monsters, from these four warriors. So he said a shira. What's the pshat? What does that mean? <laughs> what does one thing have to do with the next? It's like, okay, David and Melech was saved by Hashem, so he sang him a song. <laughs> like, how does that work out with Yevesh Zaydim? What is the connection there? That's what, that's what the Medrash says. Medrash, you want to know is Zaydim? Even though Ma'av Shemai see, Lo Hinachti Yasterasi, I didn't leave you Torah. And the proof is, because in the book of Shmuel Beis, we talk about the children of Arpa, who David and Melech was challenged by, and, he, and, he, and, and, he, and he, still, he still learned God's Torah. How do we know? Because he was singing a song. <laughs> That's what the matter says. What's the pshat here? So I think this is the pshat. I, I don't really know, but this, this is what seems to me. This is, this is my suggestion. 
I saw the, the Malbim in Tefillah's David says something very unusual. Everybody here seems to interpret the word Ovoin as inequity, right? Like uh, basically the Mitzudah Sien, which is the, the dictionary part of the Mitzudah. He says, Eve Sunni, Miloshin Oven, comes from the terminology of sin. They came, accused me of sin, but it was false. The Malbim suggests that the Yesheker Eve Sunni, Yesheker Eve Sunni means Ha'ivus, who ivus ha'seichel. An ovain means twisted. Not to have clarity, not to go on a clear or straightforward path. So he says there's an ivus ha'seichel. They sought to muddle his mind. They sought to turn his, turn his mind. Shiratsu la'ave saisi b'sheker. They wanted to twist me, to confound me with lies. To turn my heart towards denial of God. That's, that's what the Malbim says. And I'm looking at this Malbim, I'm like, I don't understand what he's saying. How do, he, has like a, he, he understood this Pasuk different. He understood that Yeveshu Zaydim, they should be shamed. Kishekidiv Sunni, because they tried to, for lack of better terminology in Yiddish, fadre my cup. So he said, try to twist my head, try to turn my head. And I but I still I still spoke about your words. So this is what this is what I think is the maybe the pshat. And and, and if I'm right, then this is pretty amazing. The Alter Rebbe, in the 26th chapter of Tanya, he deals with why a person might be sad or depressed, and he says it's really a bad idea. It's bad. Sadness, depression, it's all bad. It does not take you on a good path. So he says, okay, why are you depressed? Let's talk about it. Let's talk about the reasons you're sad. Person, you know, I'm sad. I, I have no parnasa. I have no health. And those, well, Dalta Rebbe gives you this whole story of how you should look at it. And you think God hates you, but actually it's not true. God really loves you. Well, if he loves you, why is he doing these things to me? On the contrary. That's it's a higher form of love. That's the first half of the chapter, Tanya. Okay, first half, chapter 26. Dalta Rebbe explains to you why you should not be getting depressed over your material deprivation. All right. So a person will say, okay, I'm, I'm depressed. Why are you depressed? Oh, not because everything's fine. I have more money than I know what to do with it. I, I'm still depressed. So why are you depressed? I'm a depressor. I'm a, I'm a failure. My life's a failure. I didn't succeed. I'm, 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 I'm a spiritual failure. The Rebbe says, aha, so you're a holy roller. You get depressed not from the material concerns. A person gets depressed because of Heavenly spiritual concerns. This is a person from the, from the upper cut. This is a person who really cares about his or her life from relationship with God. All these, all these missed opportunities, they bother you. So the Alter Rebbe says, Tzarech Lashes Eitzes Benafsheh, you need to figure out, you got to figure out the uh, strategy. Li you got to get rid of this. He says, Ein Tzarech Leve B'Shas It goes without saying that during the time of Avedah, that Aveda, service of Hashem, should Sarech Li is Besim Chovetu Livav. Aveda has to be done in a state of joy. This is a sidebar. There's a misnomer out there that it's a mitzvah to be happy. Because Uncle Meishi says so. <laughs> it's a mitzvah to be happy. La, 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 la. So that's how children grow up hearing Uncle Meishi sing. It's a mitzvah to be happy. All right, where does he get that from? Well, he got that from because Rav Nachman of Breslov wrote, Mitzvah G'dayi Li is Besim Okay. Right. There isn't 614 mitzvahs. There's still only 613. Rav Nachman meant that euphemistically. He said, you have to work on being joyous. But really, what is the pshat? So everybody misunderstands Rav Nachman's words, and they made a jingle and a song out of it. It's a gedola liyez b'simcha, da 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 So therefore, I should put boom boxes on a car and just dance and be, make, make myself crazy. <laughs> There's people who do this. But they're, they're actually misguided because that's not what Nachman Breslov meant. He was, a, he was a tzaddik and a Torah Jew. And uh, everything, he, his writings are Torah. And Torah, all parts of Torah, it's all connected. The, the, the Hasidus of Torah and the, and the philosophy of Torah and the homily of Torah is not disconnected from the halacha of Torah. So where do we find in halacha that you have to be happy? So gesund. Where does it say such a thing? So first of all, you'll never find it in the 630 mitzvahs. You won't. I promise you, you won't. Even though there's many, many mitzvahs, none of them list a mitzvah, mitzvah number such and such, li yes besim chetamid. There is no such mitzvah. Where does it show up? It shows up in the Sefer HaMitzvah, the Rambam at least, in the mitzvah of Lulav. In the mitzvah of Lulav, 
The Rambam says that little by little as a lulav, ulismoyach lefnei Hashem shivas yomim. You should take the lulav, you should rejoice before God for seven days. That's what the Rambam says. Now where is this? Then he qualifies, that's in the base of Migdash. And that's what Simchat Beit HaShevu is about, outside of the base of Migdash, or Yerushalayim, this is a dispute of the Rishon, and what exactly it means. In the whole city of Yerushalayim, when the base of Migdash is standing, in the area of base of Migdash, when the base of Migdash is not standing, big discussion about this. But outside of whatever that might mean, be it Jerusalem, Kotel Plaza, Temple Mount, or none of the above until, until, until the Beis HaMikdash stands again. Outside, it's only a mitzvah on the first day. Why did we take it for seven days? This is one of the injunctions of Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai. The Beis HaMikdash was destroyed. He said, we're going to remember the Migdash. We're going to be taking the Lulav for seven days as they did in the Temple. And when Mashiach will come, Amir Tzashem, it will go back to the way it was before. Okay. So, I mean, what is the Rambam talking about? It's a mitzvah to take the Lulav and be happy? Is it, are you supposed to be only happy when you take the Lulav? What about being happy when you put on film? What about being happy when you give tzedakah? What about being happy when you light Shabbat candles? What about being happy when you do any mitzvah? And does not the Torah say, Tachas ashaloyo vadata, which is in a negative, not in a positive, because you didn't serve God with joy? And one of the interpretations of that is, because not only you didn't serve God with things with good, but because you didn't serve God with joy when you could have served God with joy. So the Rambam, in the end, of the halachas of Shoifer, Sukkah, and Lulav, in the last halacha, the Rambam says something very interesting there. He says, Hashimcha sheyisma ha'adam b'shas avedas Hashem, or something like that. The joy that a person has at the time when he's serving Hashem. And the Rambam goes on to explain that it's a mitzvah to serve Hashem with joy. Because mitzvahs could be done obediently and morosely. I have to do this? Okay, if you say so, God, I don't really like doing this. You know that. I hate doing your mitzvahs. I'm going to do whatever you want. I'm a dutiful, obedient, submissive Jew. You said eat matzah now. Oh, do I hate this matzah? No problem. I'm going to eat the matzah because God said so. I'm, I'm, I'm going to put on the tefillah. I don't like it. Another schnur wants to do I can't believe it. I can't live. I can't, I, another guy asking me for money. Can I just enjoy my vacation? Can I just have another $300 meal and live in peace? Do I have to be bothered with a schnorr who wants a buck for a coffee? Oh, gosh, there's got to be an easier way to live. I reach into my pocket. Here's a dollar. Here, here, here's a dollar. Leave me alone. So you could do that. I mean, it's not the best way to give tzedakah, and it's not the nicest way to do mitzvah, but you, you know, the main thing is, hamaisa huwa ikra, our sages said. The main thing is action. So as long as you do a mitzvah, as long as you do it with joy, I mean, you do it, you did it. That's the main thing. So to ruminate on, on, and meditate on eating matzah, but never to actually chomp on the cracker and eat it quickly, you didn't have the mitzvah. But if you lamented the indigestion that this is going to give you momentarily, and, and, and you asked why God couldn't command somebody else to eat matzah and give us a mitzvah to eat donuts or something like that, or, 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 or at least like, you know, <laughs> pasta or a pizza. Why do I have to eat matzah? Does it ha- I mean, every mitzvah have to taste bad. I have to starve myself a whole of Pesach so that the night of Pesach should come. And why am I starving a whole of Pesach? So that the matzah should taste good. Because we have to, <laughs> have to find ways to make the matzah taste good. Because nobody like it, you know, dreams at night of succulent matzah. <laughs> you know, I can't wait to bite into that delicious, uh, toasty matzah. Let's get real. Okay. I'll eat the matzah, but I don't... No, the Aram says, no, 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 no. Ha-simcha she-yismacha adam. You should find joy. And I, but the Nefesh Bahamas, the animal soul says, what are you, joking with me? It's a cracker. How am I supposed to find joy in this? Well, if you be hungry enough, anything will taste good. That's, <laughs> that's for the Nefesh Bahamas. That's for the animal soul that's really hungry. And then now it's like 12 o'clock at night, so I'm happy to eat the matzah. But the Neshama should have, wow, unbelievable. An opportunity to do a mitzvah. This is fantastic. I can't believe how lucky I am. The king of all kings is now waiting for me to eat something because that will make him happy. Psh, amazing. We should be happy about this. And the Ramah goes on to describe the meaning of Ivdu es Hashem b'simcha. The terminology is Ivdu es Hashem b'simcha. Bayu lufan of birnana. That's what the Pasuk says. It says serve God with joy. It doesn't say be, be happy. Don't worry, be happy. It's a very nice song, but it's nothing to do with Judaism. Judaism says Ivdu. Ivdu comes to the term Eved. Evid means servitude. Slave away. So do that with joy. 
Do that with joy. And when you do that with joy, then you're serving Hashem for real. That's real Avoida. That's the Avoida Hashem the Ahava. That's serving Hashem with love. That's the Midah of Avram Avinu. That's how Avram Avinu served God, with joy. That's how Sari Avinu served Hashem, with joy. It was all equal. Good, bad, indifferent. It was all something to do with joy. Okay, so you have to serve Hashem with joy. Not you have to be happy. Now, because a Jew is always serving Hashem, invariably you're always going to be happy. Because whatever you're going to be doing in life is supposed to be an act of Avedis Hashem. Bechol drachecha do'ehu. In all of your ways, you have to know Him. And that's what Menachem Breslov meant when he said, don't worry, be happy. Mitzvah g'day liyas b'simcha. Tomid. Why Tomid? Because your Tomid is supposed to be an Eved Hashem. I'm always serving Hashem. If I'm always serving Hashem, I better always be happy about it. But it didn't just mean, be happy. Why? What do you mean? It's a mitzvah to be happy. No, it isn't. It's a mitzvah to serve Hashem in happiness. Come before Him in joy. That's what this is about. Now, why is it so important to serve Hashem with happiness? Just by the way, why is it so important? So first of all, it's important because if I'm, ha if I, if I'm happy about it, it means I, I want to do this. That's beautiful. I, should want, I want to serve Hashem. But the Alter Rebbe tells us a chiddush now, something we didn't know before. He says, let me tell you, this is not just a cherry on the top or a nice, nicest way to serve God. He says, you need to get rid of that depression right now. Because I don't have to tell you, Bishas HaAvedah, that you have to serve Hashem with joy. I don't even have to tell you that. That goes without saying. That's the best way to serve Hashem. But he says, Afilu mishuhu ba'al asokim You're involved in everyday life, whatever it may be. Whatever your business is, whatever you're doing. So I want to be depressed now. I'm not serving Hashem now. I'm, I'm just doing stuff. The Rebbe says, you see, in Neufele Eitz of if you all of a sudden going to start getting depressed, if you're going to start thinking, look at all those lost opportunities. Look where I could have been today. I could have been a Talmud Chacham, and I could have been a Tzaddik, and I could have been a Chassid. And instead, I'm a loser. Instead, I did all these bad things, and I have all these opportunities missed. And now I have, you know, so many decades of life have passed me by. I didn't do all these things. Even if I have decades more of life, I'll never be able to make up for it. You're right. You have to do tshuva. But the Alter Rebbe says, I want you to know that this is Tachbul HaSayetzer. He doesn't say, I want you. He says, Be dua. You should know. It's known. It's known. This is the strategy of the Yetzirah. What is the strategy of the Yetzirah? This is what the Alter Rebbe says. He says, Kedei lahapiloi achakach betaivis. This is about throwing you into the depraved depths of lust and cravings. Kenoida as it's known. Chas v'shalom kenoida as it's known. Where is this known? Where did the Alter Rebbe get this from? So first of all, with regard to this, this uh, notion, in one of the Alter Rebbe's Maimorim, the Alter Rebbe tells a story of a certain student who couldn't ever succeed at life. He always went down a bad path. Time and again. Time and again. And apparently this neshama kept coming back in many reforms, many, many incarnations, and it always failed. This Shama had extraordinary gifts, extraordinary abilities, and it would always, in the end, fail. And the Rebbe talks about this in He said, why did this Neshama fail continuously? And I'm quoting now. The Sibas Nefilosoi Kolkach, the reason this Neshama fell so low into the most depraved kinds of immoral behavior, was Shenichshel Metchila Rak Be'isad Rabbanon. First, he made a mistake with a minor infraction, a rabbinic injunction. And then what happened? What happened is v'nafal ba'atzvos g'doyla. And then he fell into a great deal of depression because he did an Aveda. So the Yetzirah made him depressed. And he says, the Alter Rebbe says, this was the strategy of the Yetzirah. It's a very high neshama. And the reason this high neshama kept stumbling was because of sadness as a result of, as a result of sin. And he says, quote, ba'atzvos gorma oid nefila b'davar hachama. This sadness, this depression, caused him to stumble yet again. Until he did terrible, awful sins. And then he could never come home. Once he did these awful sins, he just continued to stumble and fall, and then it was over. So in other words, in other words there's this business of getting down about sin, but the Yetzirah's job is to get you down. Even for holy reasons. It's like the Rebbe Rashab his birthday is today, the Rebbe Rashab once said that he heard from his father, father and the Rebbe Marash that the Yetzirah 
can sometimes show up wearing rabbinic robes. Afruma Yetzirah. A Haredi Yetzirah. Forget Orthodox. He's a Haredi Yetzirah. A Hasidish Yetzirah. What does he come along and he says, You're going to serve Hashem? You? Yeah, we know what you did. When you, you have, the, you have the, 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 you can stoutly stand before God and pray now. Shame on you. You have no right to pray. You have no right. Yeah, low life. You did X, Y, and Z. And he berates you for doing a sin. And you did do things wrong. And he berates you for it. So what happens? The Yitzhah gets you to be despondent, gets you depressed about it. And then what happens is, and then what happens is you end up falling into another sin because you're depressed, because you're sad. And, and the Rebbe Rashab said from his father, you need tremendous wisdom to be able to see through this because the Yitzhah is so wily, such a clever, very, very, very astute fellow who knows how to make you trip. And you have to be able to see through it. Because on the surface, he comes dressed in royal, royal robes, rabbinic robes, a tzaddik, a chassid. The Alter Rebbe heard a teaching from his quasi-Rebbe. The Alter Rebbe's Rebbe is the Magad of Mizrich, who was the successor of the Baal Shem Tov. The Alter Rebbe saw the Baal Shem Tov was, was born as a result of a blessing, saw the Baal Shem Tov on the day of his upsharn. Baal Shem Tov himself cut off all his hair. He told his parents, don't tell him who I am. The Rebbe once explained this was to the Hiskashras, his bond with the Magad should, not be, should be untempered, pure, he never was connected to another Rebbe. We know this because the Alter Rebbe meets the Baal Shem Tev in this extraordinary experience where the Baal Shem Tev and the Magad assume a physical form of sorts and they visit him in prison and the Magad introduces the Baal Shem Tev means he never physically saw him. He saw the image of the Baal Shem Tev. There's this concept, Tzaddikim could assume such a form. It's a Gemara in Meseches Ksubis on page 103 that talks about the Rebbe Yehuda Anasi who would assume such a form to make Kiddush and be, uh, the Sefer HaChassidim says he would come in Shabbos clothes, the base of Engel in Gilyani Ashas. He says that, that there is a concept of Tzaddikim being able to, a form, a f- to assume a f- quasi-physical form and it's actually obligated in mitzvahs when they do that. There is such a concept. So the Baal Shem Tev, they asked him, he said, who cut my hair? He said, you're Zayde. Zayde. He never, he never, so to speak, was a chassid of the Baal Shem Tev. He was the disciple of the Magad. But when, when the Magad was nostalgic, so the, the eldest disciple, the Alter Rebbe is the youngest disciple, the eldest disciple was Rabbi Menachem Mendel of Vitebsk, also known as Rabbi Menachem Mendel of Haradok. He was the man who led the first modern aliyah to Israel. In 1776, he led a group of chassidim. Two years later, competition breeds excellence. Kina from Taver Chochmah, Shlomo Melech says, the, the, the jealousy of scribes increases wisdom. Then a group of the Misnagdim in 1778, they made Aliyah to Israel as well. So just the Hasidim we're going to go to. And this became competition that bred settlement of Israel. Okay. So the Alter Rebbe regarded this Reb Mendel, this Reb Menachem Mendel, as a Rebbe, kind of a, sort of a Rebbe. Like he was a Talmud Chavir. He considered himself a part disciple. He was a, he was a peer, but he, he held him in the highest of esteem. And he was decades older than him. Reb Mendel Vitebs did not teach nearly as much Hasidus is later down. You know, it's very cryptic still, this early style of Hasidus. But he wrote a book which is called Pri Ha'aretz. And over there, in the 22nd epistle, it says like this. This is also a quote. Klal Godl there's a rule in Teira, lihiyais sameach bechelkei, that a person has to try very hard to be happy with his lot. That's a Mishnah. Pirkei Ovis it says, Ezeo Asher HaSameach Bechelkei. That's, and he says, so we usually understand that on a literal level. Be happy with the material, with, with your wardrobe, with your car, with your house, with your bank account. Be happy. Somebody else has a nicer bank account. Somebody else has a better spouse. Somebody, be happy. And usually we say that in Yiddishkeit, it's not good to be happy with your lot. You should want more. I shouldn't want more materialism. I should want more spirituality. But the, the Mendel of Vitip says something very, very interesting in Priyarts. He says, you know what? There's an element of even being satisfied spiritually, being happy spirituality. Gam be'esik ha-teira, Even in your involvement in teira. He says you have to take pleasure in your accomplishments, in your spiritual accomplishments. Because he says, Masha'en ke'enim e'ni nehene. Because if you will not find joy, if you will not find pleasure in your accomplishments, says, V'hanefesh roitze lehonas mitaiva. The human being needs to feel satisfaction. We have a drive for pleasure. God created us that way. In fact, it is the highest and most powerful drive. Why do we avoid pain? Because it's the opposite of pleasure. Every one of us is a pleasure-seeking creature. You can't get away from that. 
A person who seeks pain is a masochist. That's mental illness. That's a, a mentally ill person who needs medication, or at least very serious therapy. A normal person wants pleasure. So that's why we all want to have a good marriage. It's pleasure. We all want to have good friends. We all want to have a good society. Is that a, is that a sin to want that? Should a person hope to have a bad, toxic marriage? So a person pray to have no friends, but everybody around them can't stand them? Nobody would say that. It's sugar then. Of course you should want those things. Why? Because being in a toxic environment, being unhappy, it, it diminishes us as a human being. We're, we're built. We were built to be happy. And when people are happy, they're effective. And when people are miserable and unhappy, they're not effective. So really, there's a choice in life. Where are you going to find your, your jollies? Where are you going to find your joy? Are you going to find your joy in spiritual accomplishment or achievement? And Mendel says, if you won't find joy in spiritual accomplishment and achievement, guess what? Then you'll be looking elsewhere. And where does that take you? That takes you into lusts and cravings. With lusts and cravings, of course, become an addiction. Because really and truly, we're not built for material gratis gratification alone. And that doesn't really make us happy. And all the money in the world doesn't make people any happier. And all the sensual libido and fun doesn't make people happier. But it gives them these perks, these spurts of happiness. If you want to use psychological language, it gives you a release of serotonin. But those releases of serotonin are short-lived. And then the person remembers how good they felt when they had that fun, and they figure they must need more of it. But actually what they're really looking for is satisfaction in their life. And that only comes from spiritual fulfillment. So they become addicted to materialism. And this is the Western world we live in. It's addicted to materialism. People have less virtue and value in life and more possession and pleasure. And so we have people who are addicted. Addicted to materialism, addicted to sensual pleasure, addicted to fun, addicted to fame, fortune, or power. And they're all miserable. Well, many of them are. We have the highest levels of depression ever since records have been kept. More people committing suicide, Rahman Walsan. Makes no sense. People lived in Soviet Union under the harshest conditions, had no food, had to stand in line for two hours to get a, lo a, a, a loaf of bread. They didn't commit suicide. People are living here, they, 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 have, they don't have so much bread, they don't know what to do with it. And they're committing suicide. What's going on over here? Okay, in Soviet Union, they drank vodka to stay happy. Okay, drink vodka at least. They're not even drinking vodka, they're just killing themselves. It's, a, it's a, like total lunacy. Because the truth is a person is not meant to live an empty, dissolute life. A person is meant to live a fulfilling life. And Reb Mendel of Vitib says you have to find fulfillment, you have to find it in your spiritual accomplishments. He says you are meant to be sameach bechelke. Be happy with the lot Hashem has given you, the opportunities you have spiritually. When a person has a difficult time spiritually, he feels he was born with setbacks, Hashem loves you. He gave you a, time, a way to excel that other people don't have. You have lusts and cravings, it's another opportunity to overcome them and to serve Hashem. That's what the Alta Rebbe says here. And I could, I could elaborate on this. It's a, it's a very important concept. But I want to go back to the Tilim. Here's the point. Here's what I, is, this is what, I, what I'm trying to kind of piece together. And the Malbim, he got me thinking. So he got me thinking when he said that the oven here is Ivo Sasechel. What did the people want to accomplish when they would come to David and say, and the person who commits adultery, oh, by the way, what's his death penalty? Just, just wondering. I have a Shiloh. I have a Shiloh. And they ask you a Shiloh that's, you know, it's going to give a dig. Well, what were they trying to accomplish? What did they want? They wanted to discredit David so that he would become despondent. I once heard a rabbi say, and I don't know if this is correct. I won't even say his name because I don't know if it's correct. But a pretty smart guy. He said to me, I think David Amelech was sometimes clinically depressed. I'm like, please, don't speak Narishkeit like that. He said to me, no, read it till him. He, he struggles with sadness all the time. I said, you know what, maybe. Who said that Sadiq can't, can't have struggle with sadness? He struggled with depression. He said, I'm telling you, I, I, he's a person who himself struggles with depression. And for the most part, he doesn't use medication. He's a, a, intense therapy. And he's a, a remarkable person. I have a lot of respect for this rabbi. I have a respect for him because he's a person who publicly acknowledged that he struggles with sadness. And he works on it. And he's been able to help many people. Because people with depression come to him. And you know, he's like fellow sufferer. And he helps people through it. Maybe he's right. I don't know. He says, okay, listen, forget the holiness. That was it's nevuah. But his personality is, he's, he dealt with a lot of sadness. Maybe he's right. I don't know. If this rabbi is right, 
And if people knew that, David Melch, he wore his heart, he wore his heart on his sleeve. Like the whole tillum is, he spills his heart. He, he makes him vulnerable. And that's why David Melch relates. That's why his words resonate because it's so frank, so honest. So there's no, there's no, so to speak, uh, hyperbole here. It's brutally honest. All tillum. It's prophecy. It's holy. It's sacred. It's godly. So it touches our souls, but it's brutally honest. You see yourself in him. Mm-hmm. Every, every Yid can see himself and tell him. So David HaMelech, is, he, was, he told the people that he struggled with sadness and he struggled with a sense of emptiness and he had this aching sense of l- lack of fulfillment. And these lowlifes knew it. So what did they come to do? Mm-hmm. They came to exploit his weakness. It's the most, really the most disgusting kind of behavior. The most disgusting thing, to come to a person who has weakness and struggles and is honest about his struggles and needle him publicly about it. So David HaMelech says, they should be shamed. I should be ashamed. They should be shamed. Why should I be shamed? And he says, this is what, this is what the, 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 the Medrash Tillam, I think, is saying. Medrash Tillam says, even though I didn't abandon the Torah. Because what could naturally happen when a person gets depressed, what happens next? I get depressed, and then I lose it. Why should I toil in Torah if I'm such a bad person? If I did so many sins? If, if I'm so low, how could I? I should toil and t- I, I shouldn't even bother. So that's what they wanted to do, to discredit David, ultimately to have him veer off his path. And what was David's response? When David saw all this travail, what did he use it for? He used it as a, as a catalyst for praising Hashem even more. He didn't say, God, why did I have a whole life full of with agony? Why did you challenge me so much? He could, could ask that. What do people say? God, what do you want from my life? Why are you giving me such a hard time? Why can't you be nicer to me, God? <laughs> David Allah didn't say that. He said, I have a whole life filled with challenges. Look, the Rebbein Shalalim saved me from all the challenges. And so, Vayedab and David, this is the Hashir He praised Hashem out of the difficulty. This is what I think. This is the Pshat and the Medish. If I'm right, this is very amazing. Because the Medish said, Hey, Ma'av Samaisi, Maybe this is where the Malvum got it. Hey, Ma'av Samaisi, Ani Loi Nacht Yasatayr. I didn't abandon your Torah. And if this is correct, if this is true, now we can go back to the words of Rashi and say, Ah, look what Rashi says. Yevesh Zedim Kishakir of Sunni. Rashi just talks about the false, the, the false libel. What was the libel about? David Malach could acknowledge whatever he did wrong, but they enlarged, exaggerated the extent of David's Amel sin. Why did they do that for? They did that because David Amel's response was, I will not give in. I will not become depressed. I will not become despondent. I will study your Torah. And if, and if that helps us understand Rashi, so maybe this, 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 could, be, this could be exactly what, what Radak is saying too. They came and they libeled me and maligned me falsely. But my words, it's your Torah. They're the ones who should be ashamed. I should be ashamed. I'm learning Torah. I'm doing good things. I don't have time for this Narishkeit. I'm not going to get brought down by them. Let them be ashamed. I'm not going to be shamed. I'm not going to get depressed about this. And maybe even this could be understood in the, the Mitzudas then. David and Melech, what's he, what's he saying? If, if, this is the, if this is the thesis, they tried to malign me. David and Melech says, There was some inequity. There was some imperfection. Things didn't go exactly right. I will immerse myself in Torah. What will that do? It will save me. But what if he did something wrong? So I'll learn more Torah. So I'll be even a better Yid. I'll serve Hashem with greater fervor and joy. That's the answer. Don't get depressed. He said, don't get mad, get even. Don't get depressed. Serve Hashem with joy. Let them get ashamed. They're trying to bring me down, they'll have egg in their face. Not only won't they bring me down, I will talk and tell about Hashem's Torah. That will be the focus of my life. Now, of course, David HaMelech, though, bears this heavy sense of guilt. So he says, Yeshuvu li'ireyecha. The next verse now is understood. He says, those who revere you should come back to me. What does this mean? Rashi tells us that the Sanhedrin separated from David HaMelech because David HaMelech, as a result of this sin, 
Shapirsho Himenu Sanhedrin. He's quoting the Gemara. I'll actually tell you what the Gemara says. The Gemara in Masechus Yoma. The Gemara in Masechus Yoma, page twenty-two B, says, "Omar Rav, Rav taught Shisha Chadashim Nitzdarad David. David Amelach became a Mitzora, became a leper. He became a leper for six months. Upirsho Himenu Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin they abandoned him, they separated from him. Then Nistal came in a Shchina. David Amelach lost the divine presence. That's enough to kill anybody, bring anybody down. Let those who revere you come back to me." And then afterwards it says, Restore to me the joy, the joy of your salvation. So David HaMelech, in other words, had every reason to get down. Can you talk about depression? Six months of abandonment? Six Why months? He said he took, took himself, but do not take your Holy Spirit from him. Do not take your Holy Spirit? Him. Exactly. Because he felt, because Hashem's Holy Spirit was taken from David. So David didn't give up. He said, the door is slammed, I give up. No. He said, he said Yeshuvali. They will come back to me. He had confidence. He said, I'm going to keep doing what's right. I'm going to keep serving Hashem. I'm going to keep Yireecha. Those who revere you, that's what Rashi kind of synopsizes this Gemara. He says, Pirsha menes and hedin, shidistara, me'oisi oven from that sin. Af im grusha he, nas and einavba, even though she was divorced technically. So technically it wasn't adultery. But what is he looking at? Looked at, he noticed, uh, not appropriate. Was, it's not the sin they say it was, but still wasn't appropriate. Anybody who touches something like this doesn't come away clean. So David Amel does have reasons to get down. Nonetheless, David Amel says, they will come back to me. He doesn't say, the Sanhedrin spurned me. Ha! The heck with them. No, he, he, knew, he knew that he, he was imperfect. And he wanted to come back to me. Those who know your testimony. So those who know your testimony should come back to me. Here's David Amel speaking now, in, in a sense, I'm not going to let them get me down. And those who abandoned me, those who separated from me, they will come back to me. They know your testimony. They will come back to me. He has absolute confidence that he will rebound and serve Hashem with even greater fervor. So he's restored to me. His, his joy, joy is restored to him, yes. So, so David and Melech, his, his conduct was imperfect, right? And David and Melech is basically begging Hashem to purge him of whatever is inappropriate purge the sin, right? So that this is the leprosy, the, 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 the uh, saras that David HaMelech has. And he says, your Holy Spirit of joy is going to come back to me. And he yearned for the company of the Sanhedrin again. He didn't say like people say, oh, they, you spurn me, I spurn you twice as much. He said he, he wanted to do tshuva and he wanted to serve Hashem with joy and he wanted it to come back to him. The Marsha, in Masech Sanhedrin says, that when David Melech was isolated from everybody else because he had, some, he had the um, tzoras, he yearned with two things. Two things really bothered him. Number one, he couldn't dive with a minion. Because when you're tzoras, you have to be a bad you have to be alone. So that, he, actually he actually had tzoras for six months. And he six couldn't, months? the Gemara says so. So he couldn't, he couldn't dive with a minion. And therefore he says, the Gemara says, that's why he says, you, 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 the Pasuk starts, Yoshuv Yerecha. Those who, are, who, are, who revere me, those who come to Davin, should come Davin with me. And then, David and Melech couldn't study Torah with somebody else. He always didn't want to study Torah himself, he wanted to study Torah with Chavrusa. So that's the second half, the Yedu Those who know your testimony, your testimony refers to Torah. So here, David and Melech said, he said, These are the things I missed. These are the things I missed. I didn't miss intimacy, I didn't miss company, I didn't miss friendship, I missed Davin's dominion, I missed my ability to study Torah. And that's what David and Melech yearned for. But he didn't give in. And he didn't get down. And that's an extraordinary lesson. When they will seek to bring you down, when they will seek to discredit you, David Melch's response is, I will respond with fire, the fire of Torah. You try to send fire at me, I respond with fire, and by increasing my devotion, and not becoming despondent, and not letting them drain my head. As, the, 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 as he says, I will not let them throw me into confusion, lack of clarity. I will stay focused, I will serve Hashem with joy, and in doing so, David Melech is able to merit the concept of wholeheartedness, but that we'll talk about, Bezrat Hashem, in next week's class. That's amazing. Mm-hmm.